Oh, and welcome to the weekly space hangout for Wednesday, January 2nd, 2019. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about, of course, New Horizons, new arrival. Uh, the mother of Hubble dies. Partial government shutdown is ruining everything. Uh, remembering the father of X-ray astronomy, the stainless steel starship, Cyrus Rex at Bennu. We've got lots of topics today. Let's get into it. Joining me. Lots of downers, this... too. Yeah, I'm we've got. Just can't interrupt you. I don't care. <sighs> I was about to say that we have Kimberly Cartier, but now Paul Sutter talks, so now we've got Paul on the screen. Hey, look at me, everybody. Look at me. All about Paul. We've also got Kimberly Cartier. Oh, hey, Fraser. Happy New Year and happy podcast day. At the same day. What are the chances? That's How often right. does this happen? It's not, it, well, it's not technically New Year's Day anymore, but hmm. yeah, New Plus Year's, or minus. Good thing, because New Year's Day was busy. We were busy on New Year's Day. And of course... Morgan Renberg. Morgan. This was the year James Webb was going to launch. <laughs> which, oh, wow. which time? So, so many downers. What's wrong with oh, you? Oh, stabbed in my Must heart. Must you? Oh, okay. You monster. All right. Let's, uh, let's obviously start with the big story. The one we were all uh, waiting on tenderhooks for was New Horizons goes past Moose 69. 2014, Moose 69. Who wants Ooh. to start... Uh, who participated in some kind of live event to celebrate it? Who was involved in some form of, of various uh, publicity about it? Anyone? I was asleep. I was not, asleep. Not, not during the flyby. Yeah. I was too, too Sorry. late. Old man now, yeah. Fraser. Hey. Hey. We, well, so I didn't we, say you were an old man, too. Gosh, Paul. This very autobiographical. Paul episode's going to be giving comment. me grief, isn't it? It's gonna, well, this so is like, gonna be I, let's start one. off with that question. Like, is it worth having like flyby events like that when you don't see anything? You know, it's not like landing on Mars or something where you know you're hearing the boop 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 as it goes down and then picture appears and we all cheer. Yep. You know, like this is a big event of nothing that then days later, today was the day we were all waiting for. But couldn't they have uh, sort of timed everything? Because that's what they're really doing when they're doing the Curiosity, right? Is Or, you know, the various landings on Mars is they're just backdating it 20 minutes, waiting for the signals to arrive from Mars to find out. And so, in fact, the landing happened. They should have just told everybody and got everybody focused on this moment when the first reasonable picture was going to come back from New Horizons so we could see what it actually would looked like. Would you call like. the current picture reasonable? Yes. I would the one that came out today? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I would totally. totally. I, would tell, I would say the new picture is reasonable. Yeah. Looks so weird. Yeah, yeah. Who just... asked for that? <laughs> Let me just put the picture up here for everybody. Yeah, it's just, and already, if you compare the, I don't know which picture you're showing, if you compare the color image, which is a little bit lower resolution, to mm -hmm. the sharper black and white image, you already more. can see a few more details in the black and white one. And I think that's just like a hint of, just like with Pluto, when, even after the flyby, we were seeing all these new things kind of appear day after day after day. Like there's all these weird spots, these white white spots on it. What are they? In the color pictures, some of them kind of look like they might be craters, um, but why are they must be recent craters? Is that ice we're seeing at the bottom that they've like excavated away the Tholins? I'm really fascinated by that, by that light stripe right where the, the two mm -hmm. objects are connected like right at the neck of this oh, bowling pin, whatever that we're gonna, whatever shape we're gonna call it, but I there's like we're going a really dirty snowman. Right there. Dirty snowman. Dirty snowman. <laughs> Why is it a dirty snowman? It, there's, it's, it's a pink snowman. All right, so uh, Morgan, as our resident ice hunting planetary scientist, what did they see when they finally got these close-up images of, of MU69? Yeah, so what we're seeing here is what astronomers call a contact binary. Uh, binary meaning there's two objects, that's pretty obvious, and contact meaning that they're touching. Uh, and in contact binaries, they really could just barely be touching. And any sort of reasonable amount of force might be able to separate uh, these, these objects. Uh, and we saw a surface that is incredibly dark. Don't let the picture fool you. The reflectivity of the surface is something like 6%, which is in the neighborhood of like asphalt that you might see on a, on a road. So these pictures are really brightened up so you can see anything. 
And if you look at the color image, which is not quite true color, uh, but kind of representative color, uh, we see that it's kind of reddish. And uh, that mirrors what we saw, for example, on Pluto or on Charon, and probably at least in part suggests that there's what we call tholins on the surface of MU69. And tholins are organic compounds, uh, so carbon-based uh, molecules that basically have re reacted with the ultraviolet light from the sun, and they kind of get this gunky brown color. And then as Kimberly was saying, sort of superimposed on that dark background, we have these white regions. We have the, what I sort of think of as the neck region. And then in the smaller half, we have these two white spots. And then if you go to the um, higher resolution picture, you can start to pick out some, some more white spots. And it's, it's not clear yet what those are. Of course, when we saw them on like Ceres, they ended up being salt. I think probably ice is a better guess for what's happening here. Could these be the bottom of relatively recent impact craters that excavated away some of those tholins and left more pristine ice underneath? Um, we, we don't know yet, but the higher resolution pictures will certainly clear up things like, are these craters? So what could make one of these contact binaries form? It seems like such a bizarre structure to be to be out there everything is cataclysmic how do you get something that looks like someone just took two snowballs and just gently smirched them together and made a snowman the way these things usually are thought to work is that these objects would have always formed together not touching but out of the same local pocket of material and as sort of gravitational instability happened those pockets would have collapsed down into uh two two objects and then way out there in the Kuiper Belt, there's not a lot of other forces acting. And so sort of the slow attraction of their weak gravity would have drawn them together. Uh, but the gravity on these objects is incredibly weak. And so as soon as they touched, basically, the physical strength of the objects would have been because... enough to resist further gravitational contraction. And so, like Paul said, they basically just kind of kiss or touch very slightly. And now the forces are more or less in balance. And they just right. stay there. So they, they don't just, crunch so they down, don't they have don't enough... fly apart. There's nothing to pull them apart. Right. And there's not enough mass for them to reach some kind of hydrostatic equilibrium. They're not going to form into a sphere the way a more massive object no. would. They'd have to be more than 10 times bigger across or, right. a, you know, a uh, thousand times more massive before they'd have a chance of being pulled into a sphere by their gravity. So you just get these two <laughs> snowballs just blobbed together. And apparently I know that, that at the neck you get material running downhill both ways to sort of fill in that, that where that kiss was. But why is it so white? If that collision happened billions of years ago, which is probably the most plausible scenario, whatever process was darkening the surface elsewhere seems as if it should have darkened the surface everywhere else. And where the craters are, you can maybe imagine a more recent event happening. But like Kimberly said, the neck is weird. Like, why would that be white? Why so, not? <laughs> no, 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 see, it's like, like, why shouldn't the neck be white? Well, or... what's unique about the neck, independent, so the rest of the object looks relatively uniformly dark. Uh, and that darkening probably happened in the time since the objects came together. Uh, what process prevented the, the neck region from darkening or what process renewed material on the neck region to keep it bright, uh, even though it may have darkened in the past. It's so so with new when New Horizons flew by Pluto, I'm trying to get a sense of the the level of detail that we may end up seeing for these objects. When, when New Horizons flew by Pluto, we saw craters and mountains and plains, and we saw we saw like the shadows of these mountains. That's how close and th the level of detail that we got. Do we have an idea of how much detail and like what sort of resolution we're going to get? For these objects i haven't heard any specific seven claims they said much better Seventeen thousand kilometers was the distance for new horizons going past uh moose 69 and it flew about twelve thousand kilometers above the surface of pluto so you're looking at a difference of about 5,000 kilometers. So it's not going to be that much difference in, in different in terms of, of the resolution. 69 is also much, much, much smaller. 
And so we won't have right. the number of pixels across the body. So while the spatial resolution might be equally good, yeah. it, it might not seem as good because it'll be fewer pixels, you know, blown up bigger on our computer screen. Yeah. And I think the, the problem that we're facing here is I'm sure they were challenged, right? They had to deliver a picture because we were just going to keep nagging them for pictures until we could finally get something. The, the bandwidth is just horrible. It takes so much time to send data back to Earth from, you know, from where New Horizons is now out in the Kuiper Belt. So this is just the first rough image. And it looks like it was taken when the spacecraft was still pretty far away. Now we got to wait for those higher resolution images to come here, come back and, and we're going to, you know, they're going to fill in all the pieces. We mentioned this, I think before we're looking at 20 months for them to be able to send back all of the data that was gathered over the course of just like a day to take pictures of this close up flyby. To kind of put ME69 into context, this contact binary scenario is, is not an uncommon one. Uh, in the universe, right? You get outside the solar system and we see contact binaries as stars. That was actually sort of the original origin of, of the idea. Uh, we see them, for example, uh, 67P uh, looks like it could have been, you remember that's kind of duck shaped. It, it also had kind of a, a neck like structure. Some people think that was a contact binary. Uh, some of the smaller moons of Pluto also have that sort of duck like shape. Uh, and there's evidence that is, you know, a large fraction, maybe even half of asteroids are in binary pairs. Uh, so not all of them will be contact binaries that are actually touching. Uh, but this is probably represents a pretty common scenario, especially out in the Kuiper Belt, where interactions have been a lot less frequent. And so the chance of disrupting one of these things is, is lower. Uh, and so in some ways, we, we kind of got lucky in that if this is the one Kuiper Belt object that we're going to fly past in the next 25 years, and that seems like a pretty reasonable uh, assumption to make, then we picked one that probably is relatively representative of a common scenario out there. And that is totally different than the scenario that we see, for example, like with Pluto, where we have two objects that orbit you know, quite a distance away from one another. And this isn't hopefully the last target for the spacecraft uh, alan stewart said they still have a lot of fuel in on the spacecraft the the nuclear or the you know the the radio isotopic uh thermoelectric generator will go for another probably 10 15 20 years so so it's really up to them finding another target that's within the flight path within the cone that they could reach in a reasonable amount of time before they uh, run out of fuel. That seems pretty unlikely. Yeah. You think so? Yes. I mean, I mean, they barely found this with Hubble. Until we launch bigger telescopes or build bigger telescopes on the ground, we're, finding another object would be two or three times fainter, you know, at least. If we could barely find this with Hubble, you know, what technology do we have today? LSST. To find, um, to find something like this. Have today. To, well, LSST would be, uh, we'll be like here right tomorrow. Now. Well, you know, if even if... New Horizons can say last another 15 years. We, you know, we can't wait 10 years and then find this object because the cone of potential targets reached then will be so narrow that the odds, even if we could find every Kuiper Belt object, the odds that there's one along that cone, that incredibly narrow cone, it will be low. We, our options are exponentially more uh, today than they will be five years from now, than they will be 10 years from now. And so it's almost most important what we can find now and not what we could potentially find down the road. Hey, I'm is just saying what the... Alan Stern said. He's, ho he is, as Michael Meyer is saying in the chat, he's hopeful. He's hopeful. Well, we should all be is hopeful. Any other kind of data that New Horizons can collect while it's out there for the next 10 years? Uh, it'll collect some data about the deep space environment. It won't be as... Um, useful as the data collected by the Voyagers because a New Horizons is a more limited spacecraft. It doesn't, the, one of the key measurements the Voyagers make uh, way out there is measurements about the magnetic field and the magnetic environment in, in the edge of the solar system. And New Horizons doesn't carry magnetic instruments uh, on board because Pluto wasn't, wasn't expected to have a magnetic field. And so that they were basically re redundant instruments. It, it does have a particle detector, and so it should be able to detect the density and distribution of dust way out there and figure out sort of how that dust is moving, which will help it 
detect the edge of uh, the solar system, what we call the heliopause, uh, in somewhat the same way that the Voyagers were able to do uh, in the last five or 10 years. So at some point, it's going to help confirm that interstellar space exists and where the interaction from the sun is with the interstellar space and try to provide because i remember that they had detected a wall of hydrogen that the voyager spacecraft had also detected sort of confirming from another vantage point what's out there i mean i guess it's still useful to send more spacecraft out into interstellar space well, cool. So I hope, I mean, I guess my, you know, our plan, I think at this point is next week, we'll show you better pictures and we'll just keep doing this for 20 more months. Mm -hmm. just, That's sounds like a fine plan for me. Yeah. I'm on board. Yeah. So stay Rebel tuned. Science. Next week, we'll show you this week in New Horizons, this week in MU69. Why are we not calling it Ultima Thule? Oh, oh is this thing that we're not supposed to talk about? And, <laughs> yeah, I mean, not read Twitter. You'll Sorry, see. I was tuning you guys read, out. Yeah, yeah read, read Twitter. Twitter. You'll you'll see. What's no? Oh, actually, I have no idea what's going on. Like I said, read Twitter. Fine. Uh, let's well, move that's, on. That's never going to happen. So okay. <laughs> yeah, I know who reads ignorance. who reads Twitter. Um, but no since you sanity. since you volunteered, uh, you can talk about uh, a sad day in space. I know science. I think there's there's all these amazing figures that don't have like a huge public presence or big public persona that just push astronomy forwards and push astrophysics forward through what appears to be sheer force of will. And unfortunately, we lost someone recently, uh, Ricardo Giacconi, who was considered the father of X-ray astronomy. And you think of think of all the big results and how excited we were when LIGO and Virgo had the gravitational wave detections. And we're all like, yay, new windows into space. We can learn things we've never learned before. This is what Ricardo Giacconi did, but in the x-rays, like where we, we had optical, we had infrared, we were beginning to get cosmic ray. We were able to, you know, getting these little pieces, these little windows into the sky. And Ricardo saw the potential of X-ray astronomy. He figured that it was not a scientific challenge or an observational challenge. It was an engineering challenge to build sensitive enough detectors, get them above the Earth's atmosphere. And when these instruments first started flying in the 1960s and 70s, leading all the way up to the Chandra X-ray Observatory that was launched in 1999, you can see things. You can see things about the universe. You can learn things about the universe in the X-ray that you simply can't learn from other kinds of radiation, from other kinds of light. So he really led the effort to open this window into the universe, to open into the high energy portion of our own universe. And so it's beautiful work. There's, I'm reading an article here in a Scientific American uh, by some of his friends and collaborators. And there's this wonderful quote that uh, Ricardo often spoke of being driven like Odysseus to pursue virtue and knowledge. And I can't think of any better way to remember a scientist. Anyone else? I mean, I think we're, this is gonna, um, this is gonna kind of lead into my story. So maybe I will uh, jump into mine and we can kind of talk about them together because I think we're entering a period now when these foundational uh, leaders of modern astronomy are starting to pass away. And it's an opportunity to reevaluate uh, the, the basis on which all of the amazing work that we get to talk about today uh, came to be. Uh, because if you go back a hundred years, you know, you looked at things through glass telescopes and that's what you got. And today we have such varied tools to interrogate the universe. And those came to be very incrementally as we sort of knocked down one barrier after another. Um, and uh, he was one and another who passed away, uh, actually basically while we were, we were recording uh, last week uh, was Nancy Roman. And um, he or she um, was often mentioned as sort of the mother of the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, but her contributions to astronomy were much, much larger than that. 
Uh, she was the first um, person in charge of astronomy at NASA appointed back when NASA uh, was founded. And for basically the whole duration of the space race in the early history of NASA, she was the only female uh, executive at, at NASA. And she was instrumental in making sure that the early spaceflight programs weren't just about human exploration, uh, but also about doing astronomical research. And she shepherded uh, experiments that were carried out by astronauts on Gemini and Apollo and Skylab and on the space shuttle and early prototypes of, of space telescopes. And although she left NASA well before Hubble uh, actually flew, um, she was the sort of driving force behind the creation and justification of the space telescope program, selling it to Congress, convincing NASA leadership that this was the right approach to take. And we all know the impact uh, that Hubble had today. Uh, and, you know, she very much sort of falls into this category of uh, scientists who are, sort of work more in a support role in the sense that they're not the ones frequently out there writing the papers, you know, uh, winning the Nobel Prize, doing that sort of thing, but doing the fundamental foundational work that is necessary to give others the tools to make those discoveries. Uh, and of course, Roman was instrumental uh, in shepherding women in science across uh, all disciplines and sort of remained a, a pioneer in pushing for equal opportunities for women uh, throughout her career and into the decades of, of retirement that she had after after she led the Hubble project. I mean, it's, it's this balance between the experimenters and the theorists that always go back and forth. And often it's the theorists that end up with all of the accolades, but it's the people who help build the machines and help build the tools that confirm the theories who are many of the unsung heroes of this. Yeah. And it's the work. Yeah, right. The, like, actual, the, the, the real, real, real work of science, the blood and guts and machines and code of science. Well, and there's like a layer of that work that we don't see and we don't talk about. Like, you know, there's a whole class of positions at the Space Telescope Science Institute today, which are uh, is the organization that runs Hubble and will run James Webb uh, called support scientists. And they only spend like 10% of their time doing their own original research. And the other 90% of the time is spent doing things like calibrating Hubble and figuring out the right uh, things to use on Hubble in order to complete someone's observing proposal. So you put in your proposal and one of these scientists, PhD astronomers will help you figure out what you need to do to make your observation successful. Uh, and then they kind of disappear and they don't uh, show up when the papers are written and the awards are given. But if those people, weren't working, you know, night and day to keep Hubble and the other large telescopes running, then it would just be so unwieldy for scientists. You know, a grad student couldn't get Hubble time and learn something if they had to do everything because the body of knowledge needed is just way too large to have to know in the first five or 10 or 15 years of your, your career. You need those people who can sort of hold your hand and, and help you with the technical parts so that you can focus on the science. And they're just as important to the scientific endeavor, uh, but they don't get the recognition that that the research researchers themselves often get. Yeah. Thanks, Nancy Roman. We appreciate your uh, your work. We love Hubble. <laughs> we love Hubble and anyone who helped make it happen. All right, so I'm going to show you some pictures of the stainless steel starship. And we mentioned this, I believe, last week, but more details have come out. So I'm just going to show you this now. So our good friend Elon Musk, fan of the show, I hope, um, mentioned, uh, let's see here, let me see if I can get this. Yeah, mentioned um, the, <laughs> has been tweeting out pictures of the development of the prototype of the Starship. 
man, I, just, I feel like I've got to say this with air quotes every time I say this, but there will be a time when I will non-ironically just say Starship and the Super Heavy. And of course, this is... The, say it with air quotes and really emphasize the star. Star. Well, I, I roll my eyes. I go, oh, Starship. Perfect. That's exactly what yeah, I but Yeah, but I mean, we're like, really, like the BFR, right? BFR. So, Starship. No, it's the Starship, man. It's the. It's going to go out in uh, space. You're sassy stars. Today. So, we've got the Starship. Um, and uh, Musk has been tweeting out a bunch of pictures and mentioning a bunch of, of information. And so, what's coming together now is the, a prototype version, a hopper version of the. Of the of the BFF of the Starship, I can I can, I'll be able to do this someday, um, and you can see them constructing it. And originally, I think last week we were talking about this. Like, is it a water tank? Is is this what we're? I'm going to show the the rest of the team here. Is this a water tank that we're looking at here? Is this really going to be the the spaceship? And more pictures have shown up that you can actually see the uh, the Raptor engines, which are bolted to the bottom of this silver cylinder. So. It really does look like this is going to be the machine that they're going to be using to test out some of the technologies. And the biggest one here is going to be this Raptor engine. It has the same diameter as the eventual Starship, but it is very short, very small. So so this is just a prototype? This, this is not the actual thing? Yeah. So, no. so I don't really, know what I'm looking at here. So, so over on the right-hand side is the starship and on the left hand okay. side is what's going to be the nose cone here all right and that's, like that's not the actual drops. rocket things. no no and it's no. you know it's pretty janky looking actually uh, yeah i saw a comment on twitter that i thought was really apt which is like this is the exact opposite of anything nasa would do right they're literally building this thing in a field yeah. and it, it looks like crap it's it's dinged up uh it's you know this is like the complete summation of what's different about new space and old space. Uh, and who knows if this thing will work or not, but they're taking a totally different approach to building a prototype than you see out of like the SLS, for example, which is always gleaming and white, um, but never actually flying. And, and there's that sort of disconnect between the two. Uh, I'll show you sort of what, and so so there's a couple of things here that are that are interesting, right? The first thing is to test out these these Raptor engines, which is is a new SpaceX engine design to hop with something that has the overall size width characteristics of the Starship. And the other thing is to use this idea of stainless steel, and and Musk had hinted at this. Uh, a couple of months ago that they were coming up with a new design for the Starship and he said the design is delightfully counterintuitive or something like that and now we're starting to see the details of, of about what this is and so we've got this th the thing being made out of stainless steel and not uh, composite materials the way it, that it carbon you know, fiber was, yeah carbon Why fiber composites. stainless steel so the idea is so it won't has rust to, yes it won't, it, it's stainless won't rust there's so in much space. water in space. Yeah, space things rust in space all the time. No, yeah. that actually the so one of the big requirements of the Starship is that it's going to be able to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. And as you're re-entering the Earth's atmosphere from orbital velocities, you have to deal with an enormous amount of heat. And so the the although carbon composites are wonderful, they melt and completely fall apart in high heat environments. And so you would need to have a lot of um, uh, some kind of shielding that would be able to protect your carbon composites. But by going the stainless steel route, you actually can get a material that can, that can slowly transfer the heat into the interior of the spacecraft. And if you time things right, you should be able to re-enter the atmosphere and before everything is cooked inside the spaceship, and when you hopes. make your landing one hopes and so this is this is the plan this is this is the direction that they're going down now with with starship and we will see if this actually if they actually pull it off so as i think as, as morgan as you said you know they're they're building this it really looks crude i mean if you look at some close-up pictures of it there's sort of like the panels are dented and 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 really look uh fairly roughly attached but we should see hop tests in the next few months. 
and then the actual full spaceship is being developed back in in Los Angeles and if this works then we should see the full spaceship start to do some hop tests uh, by next year and then hopefully the thing will actually be able to go to to orbit but I love and people are mentioning this in, in the chat like I love this thing looks this thing just absolutely looks like uh, what 1950s science fiction covers look like right <laughs> that's a good point it's true. right the thing will take off vertically it'll land vertically it's gleaming shining chrome i it might have lasers it, it had better have lasers i cannot <laughs> wait i'm really excited about what uh about what this is going to look like this is this is like my science fiction christmas I have to say I'm still a bit skeptical, but I'm always a bit skeptical about Elon Musk's <laughs> pipe dreams. And then sometimes they work and I am proven wrong. So. Allow me to show but you this pipe is made out of stainless steel. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Allow Changes me to show you some uh, video of some rockets landing together. Just any time I doubt, I just watch those those rockets landing side by side. It just brings you back to reality. Which is that we get what we Fraser. want. It just takes Fraser, more we time. Can't hear Earth you. to Fraser. Ground control, Fraser, come in. Am I muted? You're muted. How am You're I muted? muted, dude. Am I muted to the audience as well? No. no. Oh, okay. no. How do we do this? Oh, now I'm oh, here. <laughs> Unloop the loop thing. <laughs> oh. Oh, I see the problem. So, there is that better oh, I see. well i feel like we should move on and talk about other depressing topics such as the fact that our federal government mostly doesn't work right now all right do it <gasps> fraser welcome back that's good because what i said was like really stupid and nobody heard it actually oh, everyone you know what the whole audience heard it you guys didn't oh it's okay <sighs> our opinion of you probably wouldn't have changed yeah it's okay go ahead then so Back in 2018, in December, uh, our the U.S. federal government partially shut down due to lack of funding because uh, Congress and the president did not agree on where money should be spent. And so about a quarter of our government is currently not operating. It's been about two weeks now. Uh, and a number of federal science agencies uh, have been affected by this. Uh, a few federal science agencies haven't been affected because their budgets were passed into law. Uh, some good things like the National Institute of Health and the Center for Disease Control are still running. Good. Very good things. Um, however, NASA, the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Geologic Society, all of these agencies have been shut down for about two weeks. Uh, more than 300,000 federal employees are furloughed and about 400,000 more uh, so-called essential personnel are working without pay and have been for two weeks. But what this means is that a lot of essential government functions that these agencies are performing have not been active for about two weeks now. Uh, and this has affected countless researchers around the country. It's affecting uh, science. It's costing millions or billions of dollars uh, in lost revenue uh, and scientific progress. And this is a real issue uh, for just about every branch of space and earth science. Uh, things 98% like- 98% of NASA. Yeah, 98% of NASA cannot right work, cannot it's... access their computers or their uh, work emails. Uh, so things that we were just talking about, like the New Horizons flyby, which happened on New Year's during the shutdown, uh, they were forced to work around through one of the uh, major university partners in order to get a lot of the press releases out and do and get that information out there. Uh, the OSIRIS-REx orbit, which happened just before New Year's, also during the shutdown, went through a different university partner to get that information out. Um, and so it's, it's a huge thing. Uh, luckily, I will say that uh, some missions are still moving forward. Things, uh, missions where all the work is already in the like outside contractors' hands, like James Webb, Mars 2020, those kinds of progress, th those kinds of missions uh, are still able to move forward for the time being until any of those contractors need to actually you get know, paid. contact the agency or get paid or yeah. have any sort of executive decisions made. 
And I can't um, see any problem with one of those contractors spending months and months and months without any interaction with NASA, for example. Yeah, clearly uh, that's gone so well in the past, as oh. we've seen, especially with certain giant telescopes whose name we're not going to say again. Um, but also uh, even down to like the, the individual researcher level at universities, uh, a lot of researchers get NSF grants, for example, uh, and that grant cycle is paused. And that's going to affect scientific research for months to come as scientists can't submit grants and can't access some of their funding. Um, I will say, luckily, uh, with NOAA, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, none of their oceanic research vessels were actually out at sea when this happened. Otherwise, they would have had to turn around and go back to port. That would have been kind of catastrophic but the luckily that's, that didn't happen we'll have <laughs> this, to come yeah, back so, in and land yeah the satellites would have had to come down you know but no but one of the one of the major things is that there are many fewer employees at these agencies monitoring these satellites and can access these data a lot of which are critical in times of natural disasters uh, around the world and we know just recently uh there was a a terrible uh earthquake and tsunami and volcanoes that have been happening indonesia was hit very uh very badly just recently, and a lot of the Earth monitoring satellites, uh, there were many fewer people to actually monitor during these disasters. So I, I don't really have many positive yeah. things to say at this moment or any sort of action items that we can do, except just be aware of sort of the, the ripple effects that this is going to be having for the next month, even if the government reopens tomorrow knock on wood, uh, we're still going to be feeling this for many months. How does this play out, right? I mean, I, I would imagine if I was a government employee and I was told to not work and not make money, um, I would, within about two weeks, start looking for a job. Sure. Right? Uh, there's going to be no one at your agency to process your resignation request. <laughs> Sure, they can get it after the, when they all come back and they find out mm -hmm. what happened to me, right? But I, I mean, if I work in computers, if I work in finance, if I work in engineering, right? You know, mm -hmm. you would like how long will a person at NASA, for example, not take a paycheck? Like at a certain That's point, an excellent question. They're, they're gonna they're gonna personal. go and work for SpaceX, or they're gonna go, or, you know, maybe they're gonna get a work with get a job with the European Space Agency, or maybe they're gonna be able to get, or they're just gonna have to find a job. In a, You'll get back paid, Google. Though, right? If you come back from furlough, they're not guaranteed to not get guaranteed. back paid, okay. but yeah. they most likely will. Uh, but this is like this is one of a huge stack of reasons why why when Hubble launched in 1990, the astronomical community got together and basically told NASA that they couldn't be in charge of it. Uh, and this entirely separate non-governmental organization called the Space Telescope Science Institute operates Hubble. And NASA basically gives them money uh, every year to do that so, so that the, these sorts of bureaucratic issues are at least a little bit removed from doing science. And JPL, for example, uh, works in the same way. Uh, NASA gives money to Caltech every year, and then Caltech uses that money to run JPL. And so while the government is shut down, JPL is the only NASA center operational uh, because their paychecks are written by Caltech. Uh, and as long as the shutdown doesn't last until next year, you know, Caltech has that money and will will use it to keep JPL running. Uh, and so that's kind of like a workaround for sort of the basic problem of just funding the government, which is sort of like a uniquely American challenge uh that sort of hinders like kimberly was saying all of the work that could be done and the united states government is like the leader in scientific research across a huge swath of fields but every time one of these things happens it seeds that position a little bit more yeah. to europe or to china or to india uh, you know, places that can figure out how to operate their government, you know, 24 hours a day, 365 <laughs> days a year. And, you know, this is, this doesn't make it easy to keep talent, to plan missions, yeah. to just like, to get stuff done. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the United States is going to sort of throw away their leadership role if these things continue to become more frequent. Like, this is the third one this year. You know, this, this is yeah. a common 
thing now, and it's going to eat away at the workforce uh, and the expertise that the government needs to to get the job done. So what are the options to to have this resolved? Well, Keep the president the, will have to president. compromise with Congress. And yeah, that seems as of this evening, not uh, imminent. Yeah. Uh, of course, the, the Democrats will take control of the House starting tomorrow and will begin to try to pass things. And presumably the Senate will try to pass things as well. Uh, but if those things don't align with the president's priorities, then one side or the other is going to have to give way. Um, and right now, that seems to be basically a political calculation. And both sides see things to like in the politics of the current situation. Um, but that, you know, is irrelevant to the, you know, seven or 800,000 people who are just trying to do their jobs. Um, and so it's there's not a clear end in sight. But as I said, you know, if it, if it was like depending on what these people are capable of and what kinds of positions they can have available to them, I'm sure Google, Facebook, right? These companies, Uber would be glad to give a lot of these NASA employees jobs. And then, of course, there's other countries, right? Folks in China, Europe, um, the Middle East. I mean, there's there's there are jobs for skilled people in the aerospace fields and 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 to go through three of these at a certain point, you would say, I don't want to go through this anymore. I want to go get a job in the private industry, which sucks because, you know, you need it's these people to working at NASA. This may be the cynic in me, but I don't think that that particular argument is entering into the minds of the people making this decision right now. <sighs> it might be the cynic in me that's saying that. Uh, and it also kind of really sucks to say to the to say to all these federal workers, yeah, you may love your job, but your government doesn't particularly care about you doing your job, so go get a job elsewhere. Yeah, kind of kind of sucks to have to say that. Um, and and then when that happens, yeah. then you're left with the people who weren't able to get a job somewhere else. And the people who did leave, or the people who are particularly loyal. No, but I mean, this living is. In DC. I, mean, I guess so, maybe. But I mean, this is a big problem. Like when you're in in a in a company and the company is starting to go off the rails, the smartest people, the people who have the most job opportunities, are the ones that skip out first. They're the ones who leave right away, and then, sort of everybody that is left had a harder time finding a job. Is you know is more specialized to this one specific career and it sort of unfortunately brings down the overall capability of the organization so by going through this process they're going to be sloughing off the people who are able to go and get a job and they're like i'm not going to put up with this anymore so this is i mean it's going to be a kind of a brain drain which is which is also really sad one thing that we haven't mentioned is that the american astronomical society meeting is coming up very very soon uh, and Party time. many slash all of these NASA employees uh, will not be able to attend if the government is still shut down because Party it is considered game. a work activity. So that would be a an incredible drain on that particular meeting. Yeah. Crossing my fingers. <laughs> I don't know. So I hope next. Well, Next week, we'll be able to talk about how the shutdown is over and everybody's back to work and the science is on. Knock on wood. <clears throat> Knock on wood. Now, we were all so busy talking about New Horizons and MU69, but there was another interesting event that happened, and you hinted at this, which was, of course, that uh, OSIRIS-REx arrived at uh, Bennu, finally. Bennu. Uh, and it broke a couple of records so it arrived just before so on december 31st and it broke a couple of records it was the smallest object that's ever been orbited and it was in the tightest object that the tightest orbit that's ever been attempted uh an orbit of uh, under two kilometers and we got a whole bunch of great pictures of very very cool of Bennu as osiris rex has been has been orbiting around it and I saw uh, Emily Lakdawalla trying to come up with ridiculously slow speeds. speeds that you would need to to go into escape 
velocity. Like <laughs> you could, like a snail would probably stay on the object, but a gecko would walk off. But a gecko would walk off, or something like that. Exactly, <laughs> right? Well, at least we know there's no geckos on there. It'll... Well, because they all no fell off, right? Because they all launched themselves into orbit. But the place right. is crawling with with uh, snails and cockroaches. I believe cockroach I've was the looking fine at these line. pictures uh, that they've been sending back, and I don't exactly know what to make of it. It like seems so normal um, <laughs> that you know it's like sixty-seven P was weird. Uh, obviously, we're seeing that MU sixty-nine is weird. This is just like a big rock covered by smaller rocks, which presumably are covered by smaller rocks. There's not like any big craters or dents or rifts or anything. It's it's just there. And I think it's a good reminder that... Not some everything... rocks are just there. Right. So, some rocks, rocks are, are there, boring. And, you heard uh, it from Morgan Renberg, PhD. <laughs> yeah. Rocks are there. I don't know. It, just, it, it lacks some, some of that pizzazz that some of the weird discoveries we've seen before are it doesn't mean it'll be any less scientifically interesting but it's it's just there here but you were saying before is that there are so many similarities visually to ryugu with with hayabusa too that we get two data points now of very similar objects so that the pizzazz maybe may have been stolen a couple months earlier but I mean, it's still going to be scientifically valuable and help oh, us out. Oh, it's going to be hugely valuable. It's just, it's so normal that we're so accustomed, I think, to every space thing being weird. Like, think of those, like, weird ravioli-shaped moons on Saturn. It's just all, everything is weird. And, and this just seems kind of normal. This is like if maybe all, you of, maybe all of the of special, asteroid. maybe all the special stuff of this one is under the surface. Or not, or like in infrared or x-ray. Maybe there's something special in a different band. Well, they already found water on it. Well, duh. <laughs> like, there's water <laughs> everywhere. Wow. Wow. Sorry. Oh, Press. I'm sorry. Is this Dr. like... Cartier. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's water everywhere. There's water on Mercury. I'd be surprised if there wasn't water. Well, well you would be. I, I didn't say it. That wasn't... I, those weren't my words. <laughs> Just because you said it first. Yeah, I saw a, a story about, the, about people simulating what the glaciers on Mercury seem to look like. So, glaciers on Mercury. yeah, how the glaciers there's on Mercury, water on Mercury <laughs> in the permanently shadowed craters on on Mercury, and so the way they they shift down into these craters while the sun is blasting just over the crater rim. So, yeah, water everywhere. Yawn. And not a drop to drink. What else is news? Uh, well, we're reaching the the end of our of our hour. We did it. We made it. Um, and before oh, we move on, another hour, <laughs> to three. another, uh, before we move on to, uh, let everybody do what they're going to do tonight. I want to give everyone a chance to shamelessly self promote something that they're working on. Paul, what do you got? Hey, party in the desert. Who's in? Oh yeah. Yes. You guys can raise your hand too. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing an all-stars party in joshua tree national park this june the very last weekend of june it's going to be tons of fun we're staring staying at the miramonte indian well spring and resort during the day and then every night we're getting bussed into the desert for a star parties hosted by oceanside photo and telescope it's featuring so many people uh, i'm going phrase is going pamela is going Skylace is going, John Michael Godier is going. We're having tons of fun. There's going to be lectures and panel discussions and furious debates, maybe kickboxing. I don't know. We haven't really set a schedule yet. And there's going to be drinks, there'll be booze, there'll be food, and there'll be stars and maybe ice cream. I don't know. We have a budget for ice cream. Um, I will but... I will teach you the night sky. That's the thing I promise. Fraser will teach you the night sky. Dustin Gibson himself from OPT will teach you astrophotography. I will tell really bad jokes for four days. Probably not selling it well. I should leave that out. Uh, John Michael Godier will tell you about, you know, there, there's going to be awesome, awesome stuff. Uh, go to astrotours.co slash allstars to sign up now. And those guys sign are going to be amazing. Although <laughs> yeah. It's going to be gorgeous. And I it, hopefully the government shutdown is will be over by then because apparently Joshua Tree is getting pretty nasty right now. All of them are getting pretty yeah, nasty Yeah, all right now. the parks are getting pretty nasty right now. 
Okay, so hopefully we're not going to talk about it. They remember hopefully it, Fraser. the we're government selling. will be back. We're right selling it. We're selling Positive. it. <laughs> yeah. Positivity. Yep. Good time. Good times. Uh, Morgan, what do you got going on? I have been involved in a marathon writing session this week, uh, all about the space race. Um, this is going to be part of an exhibition that we're opening at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History this spring. And it's just gotten me like so much caught up in the excitement of the space race again to, and it's been working on basically a timeline and it's just like every week something's happening and every mission is just this amazing first time this first time that, and it kind of takes you back to a period in which everything was new. Uh, and you know, something like this flyby of ME69 is so great because it gives us a taste of that uh, in the 21st century when it seems like we know a lot about a lot of things. Uh, and so I've, I've been having a lot of fun uh, going back in time and sort of wondering at all those new things again. Kimberly. So speaking of MU69, I'm going to be writing some excellent stuff about that coming up soon, uh, which you can read all about on eos.org. Uh, and then I'm going to get to revisit some of my favorite Earth satellites, uh, looking back down at the Earth and some amazing locations. And remember that uh, interstellar asteroid Oumuamua, uh, we're going to be figuring out, the summarizing the spaceship one. That's totally not aliens. Um, <laughs> going over what the heck is going on with that and what we've learned in the past year i i can't wait we've learned new things so much stuff wow uh awesome well uh i just dropped a new question show on my channel work there's another one that's in the works right now all about uh project dragonfly which is a interstellar probe concept not the Chinese search engine made by Google. So uh, you should check that out. That'll be dropping in the next couple of, of days. And then I'm working on NASA's techno signatures uh, conference that, and document that they just yeah. released. Very cool. So lots of good stuff coming. I've been also writing up a storm. So check it out shortly. Uh, well, hey, before we wrap this up, I would, of course, love to thank our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is the time that you join the Weekly Space Hangout crew as Google Plus is sunsetted. Uh, you're going to need some island to hang on to, and that is going to be the Weekly Space Hangout crew's website. So go to wshcrew.space. They'll hook you up. They'll get you into the internal Slack community and the forum that they're working on as a way to hang on and chat and nerd out about space with all of your friends forever. This is it. This will be the good place forum. that you're going to want. A nice, solid platform that Google can't shut down. Stable. Stable. As we broadcast this on YouTube. Uh, so uh, go to wshcrew.space and join them. And thanks everyone watching. Thanks to my panelists for joining me today. It's, it was fun as always, and I look forward to a whole other year of crazy space news. Thanks everybody. Let's do it again. It's 2019. 2019, we did it. We made Wait, it. Wait, what? Yeah, that's right. All right, we'll see you next week, everybody. <laughs>